Hi. So a bunch of years ago, Ian and I watched every single Universal monster movie ever made. Criteria was that it had to be a character that was a part of a series. So all the Draculas, all the Frankensteins and Wolfmen and stuff like that. We even threw Hunchback and Phantom in there because Phantom got a remake and Hunchback's kind of the first one. We did a pretty broad, broad rule on that. And you can see all those videos except the mummy with Brendan Fraser got taken down permanently. I'm working on that. It'll re-upload. It's not a big deal. Point is, we watched all of them. Every single one. Every Universal Monster movie. Every single Universal Monster remake. Everything. Every, from fucking Van Helsing to Monster Squad, which isn't even a Universal film, to 2017's The Mummy, to we even included The Monsters, because it's a Universal distributed film, I think, or they produced it. I don't remember. I've seen them all. I've seen every single one. I got all the street cred, all right? I'm, I'm up to date, including all the remakes, including Demeter. Demeter was awesome. My issue with the Universal Monsters has always been how they've handled their crossovers. I'd argue that there's just blatant, blatant false advertising. Look at the poster for Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. That's the poster. They're literally duking it out. It's insane. And you watch that movie, you watch an hour of people talking, nothing happening, no build-up, no character work. It's just Lon Chaney Jr. stumbles into like a random town and I don't know what to do. And then Frankenstein unfreezes from a block of ice and they play weird music. And then the last two minutes, maybe, are Frankenstein and the Wolfman are just like trying to strangle each other to death. Like it's so uneventful. It could have been way more interesting. House of Frankenstein is the first with all three. That's a big deal. The first half is a solo Dracula film with just Dracula, doesn't meet anybody else. Then he dies halfway through the movie. Then the second half is just Frankenstein and Wolfman coming back again. And it's like a sequel, but kind of a remake because they retread the exact same thing. I'm shocked. I'm shocked at how they handled that premise with those characters. The greatest horror icons of all time in all cinema. They just dropped the ball. And they kept dropping the ball over and over and over again. And it makes you ask, what was the point of even doing that? I mean, I love their films. I love the classic Dracula film, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, Invisible Man. New Invisible Man is so good. Their latest one is Demeter. I freaking love Demeter. I saw it in theaters. I can't wait to do a commentary on it. I got some strong feelings about it. Ever since we did the Monsterthon, all I could do was just wonder, what if those movies, the House movies, the Meats movie, what if they were good? What if those characters meeting each other was on par with when the Avengers all met? So I decided instead of years of just complaining about films over the commentary track to just, what if I were in the driver's seat? What if I were taking control? What would I do? Now, I don't have $100 million for a giant blockbuster film, or 300 if you're 2017's The Mummy, but I do have a brain, and I have, not to brag, I have some good ideas. What my book's done, which I have not seen done in a serious context outside of like a joke or a comedy, is all of these monster characters interacting with each other. Every single time I've seen that happen, it's a Hotel Transylvania or Abbott and Costello. It's always played off for laughs. And that's fine. That has a place. I'm so glad that exists. But that's not all there is to a monster mash. It's so much more interesting than that. Even Monster Squad. Yeah, that was played in somewhat of a serious context, but A, the monsters were the villains, so you barely saw them. It was all about the group of kids. And B, it was so 80s cheese that it took away from the horror aspects of those characters. I knew there was a way to maintain the gothic horror tone of the original characters and source materials of Dracula and Frankenstein while also creating a story that involved all of them. We got vampires, werewolves, creatures from certain lagoons that are legally distinct from certain ones on screen. I basically put my money where my mouth is. I've been complaining for years and years about how Universal's handled their characters, and I just said, screw it, I'm doing it, and I made it. And this, this is what Universal could be doing with their characters and never have for a hundred years. Yeah, 1923. Dude, this year is the hundred year anniversary of the first Universal monster film, Hunchback of Notre Dame. In the century of time that it's taken, the characters have not crossed over outside of bad movies. I'll defend Van Helsing. This is the book. I'm so proud of it. This is the coolest thing ever. So I designed the logo because I'm also a graphic designer. I'm a lot of things in relation to this book. I made it so that the logo can do this, and it stays. 
and that took so much more time than it ever deserved to take, but I made it happen. Uh, pictured here is an eclipse, that is a solar eclipse. Um, that is because the bulk of the modern day portion of the book, specifically towards the last third of the book, is taking place during the April 8th, 2024 eclipse in Nazas Durango, Mexico. That is where predominantly the climax takes place. When the moon starts to go over the sun, the climax kicks into gear. There are important thematic reasons for that, but read the book and find out. I will be attending that eclipse. If anybody in the world wants to meet me, this is the way to do it. This is where to go. I'm really happy with how this turned out. Oh, just listen to that. Just... Oh, man. Whoo! Damn! Now, you'll notice a very tiny black line. I don't even know if this crappy little camera can pick it up, but it's towards the end of the book. It is the last chapter before the epilogue. It is called Hoxton's Journal. The rest of the book is all just text, obviously, but Hoxton's Journal, well, that's where you get the good stuff. This journal, this fictional journal, was written by a character who tried to hunt all of the monsters, but has been revised by another character who's trying to collect the monsters. And he's kind of the primary force of the book. He's in the prologue, Waylon Ross, it's a whole thing. Waylon Ross is the deep Australian voice you heard in the trailer. So the structure of the book is a little bit weird. The first five chapters are more or less standalone. There's little connective tissue threads throughout, but they, it looks like an anthology. It'll feel like an anthology until you hit chapter six. That is where the book's identity reveals itself. All of the connective tissue that you didn't see is clear, and all of the direction of where the book is going to go is made apparent. So if you're reading and you're three or four chapters in, and you're like, ooh, I don't know where it's going, just get to chapter six. That's all I ask. I didn't plan it, but it starts on page 69. Nice. The length of the chapters varies a little bit. On average, they're 10 to 15 pages. The longest one is probably 20, and the shortest is like four. It's a fragmentary chapter written by a character before he died, so it's obviously unfinished on purpose, but that is what it is. And that's basically it. The pre-order link is live. It's on Amazon right now. It comes out October 1st, right in time for the holiday season, but the good holiday season. I really only wanted to write a book that I knew didn't exist, that I knew nobody had done yet. Otherwise, I would own it and read it. And then I'd throw in the towel and be like, okay, never mind. It's, it's real. I'm good. I'll stop complaining. But it's not real. I made it real. I did that. Thank you for watching. I'll be revealing a lot more about the book in the coming weeks. There will, of course, be a second trailer on launch day. It's over twice as long as the first trailer, and it's it's one of the it's one of my favorite pieces of editing I've ever done. But we'll get there. If you've been following this channel for any amount of time, first of all, thank you. You don't have to do that. I really appreciate that. But this is a labor of love. I, I've been talking a lot about my disdain for the treatment of the characters by Universal, but at the end of the day, they also made good decisions with all those characters. They also made some of the best, and frankly, this book would not exist had Universal Pictures not made all of those movies, whether that's good or a bad thing. Have a great night, and I will see you next time.